So this is EE six nine eight G lecture eleven, and we are looking at the small signal phase domain model. of the dl so we developed this model in the last lecture we have the small signal phi ref of s we have to subtract phi out of s from this let's say we have phi out of s here so you get a phase error phi error of s this sees the gain of the PFT plus CP, which is ICP by 2 pi. So the average current coming out of the charge pump is basically phi error of S into ICP by 2 pi. And this flows into a capacitor. So to get the voltage, we multiply it with 1 by SC. And this gives us the small signal control node voltage. This then sees a gain of KDL. So Last lecture, I had used a subscript KDLR to show that this was in radians per volt. Now I'm going to drop the subscript just to keep things cleaner. So anytime we use it in the phase domain model, it is with the understanding that this KDL is represented in radians per volts. Okay. Now this gets added. And we have the phi out of this. And the loop is closed like this. Okay. Any questions on the model? Okay, good. So the, now the next step would be to calculate the loop gain. Loop gain transfer function. So this is our loop, right? Now we are interested in calculating the loop transfer function. So we break the loop. And we inject a test phase, a small signal test phase. And we go around the loop and see how much is coming out at the other end. Now, in calculating this loop transfer function, we have to make sure that there are no other independent sources in the system. Therefore, we have to de-energize this fire of office. So basically, this gets grounded. OK. So can you calculate the loop gain? What is phi out of S? So this is phi test of S. As it comes here, we get a minus sign into ICP by 2 pi C into 1 by S into KDL. And that gives us the phi out of S, right? So now I can calculate phi out of S by phi test of S. This will be equal to minus ICP KDL by 2 pi C into 1 by S. And this is equal to minus L of S. Therefore, L of S will be equal to ICP KDL by 2 pi C into 1 by S. Now I can calculate the magnitude of this loop gain. And this is given by ICP KDL by 2 pi C to 1 by omega. Just uh, manipulation of the equation, right? Now, can you tell me what this omega is? What does it represent now? If this were a voltage signal and there is some omega, you will tell me that this is the this is representing the frequency of that voltage signal. Now, what does this omega mean here? So, we are getting a small signal uh, phase fluctuation. Mm -hmm. So, this omega is for the uh, variation of the phase in that voltage. Right. Is that clear for everyone? So, let me explain that in detail. Right. So let me first again refresh your memory as to how we had defined our reference of T. 
So uh, reference of T is a square wave. And we said we could define this as some function, some gamma of total phase. Right? Now this can either have a value one or zero, corresponding to the one or zero here. Right? And then we said that we can define it in the following manner. So gamma of phi f of t will be one if a sine of phi f of t is greater than one. Similarly, this will be equal to zero if sine of phi f of t is less than, sorry, this has to be greater than zero. This has to be less than zero. If sine is positive, sine of the total phase is positive, then we say that f of t is one. Gamma of phi f of t is one. If sine of phi f of t is less than zero, then gamma of phi f of t is zero. It's basically like taking the sine wave and passing it through a comparator, right? So the reason for writing it in this format is because it makes it easier to understand the effect of phase advancement and phase delay, right? So for example, this will be equal to some operating point phase plus a small signal phase. Okay, now this operating point phase is simply going to be equal to omega ref into t. Now the small signal phase could be a positive value or a negative value, right? Let's assume that this is a negative value. Okay, at a given instant, if small signal phase phi ref of t is negative, that means that my total phase is decreasing. Therefore, what does it mean for a given edge? Delayed or advanced? Delayed. delayed. So if the total phase is reducing, then the signal is going to get delayed. So all these edges will move in the following direction. Okay. So this is corresponding to a delay in the total signal. Now the other side, of course, is that small signal phi ref of t is positive, which means that the total phase is a more positive value than the earlier uh, operating point phase. What does this mean for our signal? So all these edges are advancing. Okay, is this clear? If the total phase is reducing, if there is a decrease in the total phase, it means that the signal has delay. If there is an increase in the total phase, if the total phase accumulates, it means that the signal has advanced. Okay, so keep this in mind. Now we are going to draw a lot of plots for different cases. So case one, this is just a revision. Let's say I have my reference of T. Then the total phase, operating point phase of the signal, how does it look like? This is going to increase. And for every T ref, this is going to increase by 2 pi. Okay. So now let's do case 2. Now I'm going to add a phase step on the signal. So to this, I'm going to add a small signal phase. So this is TRF and sometime after TRF, there is a small phase step. Okay. So then the total phase will be. So this is the total phase with respect to time. Now this was the operating point phase. On top of that, we now have a phase step after TRF. So the signal is going to look like this. Okay. How does our square wave change? Oh, 
what will happen to the square wave? It will be leading, right? From what edge onwards? After TRF. Yeah. So these points see the same phase as before. Now all the edges after this point is going to advance. Right? So I will have the signal going like this. Is this clear? Now let me consider one more case. So now I'm going to have a slowly varying phase like this. Okay, can you plot the total phase and the reference signal? Please try. So now our phase is going to vary very slowly like this, right? So if I look at it, all these edges need to now be advanced because the phase is now higher than the previous value. And these have to be advanced in the same direction because all of these are positive and by roughly similar amounts. So you'll have a signal like this. The face information is varying very slowly. Okay. Now I can quickly do a case four where the face is still varying slowly, but in the negative, it's a negative face. So let's say I had a face that was varying like this. Okay. So this is. TRF information is not relevant. So now, on, if this was the original operating point phase, now I'll have something moving slowly underneath it, right? So all the reference edges, what will happen to the reference edges? They'll get delayed. So this edge is going to see the maximum delay and all the other edges will vary slowly around us. Okay. Now case five. I could also have a high frequency fluctuation in the phase. Okay, now can you plot ref of t for this? So now this is going to fluctuate in this fashion. Now the edges could move front or back. It could get advanced or delayed depending upon the value corresponding to the edge. So this edge remains at the same place. What happens to this edge? It gets advanced. What about this one? That gets delayed. Then the next edge is advanced. 
this edge is roughly at the same place. No, it gets delayed a little bit. Yeah. No, it gets advanced, right? Etc. Okay, so now we have a very jittery clock. The edges are moving back and forth, right? So now if I have given you a fire F of T, a small signal fire F of T, I can easily calculate its Laplace transform fire F of S, or I could look at its Fourier transform fire F of J omega. And this omega is basically telling us how fast or slow is my small signal phase fluctuating, right? And that in turn will tell us how fast or slow is my edges in the signal moving around its ideal position. So for example, if I were looking at case two or case three, case, case three, case four, et cetera, the phase is moving very slowly, right? So if I were to plot the magnitude of phi ref of omega versus omega, you'll see that you have a lot more low frequency components, right? Whereas for the last case where phi ref of t was fluctuating a lot, if I take its Fourier transform and then look at its magnitude, you'll see that there are more high frequency components. So that's all. This omega is basically telling us the rate at which the phase signal is changing, okay? So this can get a little confusing in the beginning because we are looking at total phase uh, which itself represents how fast or slow a voltage signal is varying, correct? But now that phase signal has a frequency. Yeah. Correct. So the, uh, this is our, so you're basically asking about the operating point, right? So the operating point is now this. This is our operating point line. This is available, right? If I did not, if I had a very clean square wave and I look at its face, this is what I would see. Yeah. We are measuring everything with respect to fire of t. So every node will have a, a operating point bias, right? So fire f of t, this will have an operating point bias as shown here, as we just saw. Now phi out of t will have another operating point, which is basically fire f of t's operating point shifted by t ref. Yeah. This is clear. Okay, now if this is clear, we can get back to our L of S. So what was the expression for L of S? ICP, KDL by two pi C into one by S. Okay, so uh, let's do the usual stuff. Can you do the Bode plot of this? So if I do 20 log to the base 10 of magnitude of L of J omega, and I plot this with respect to omega, but in log scale, how would it look like? Okay. So it there is some frequency at which this loop gain becomes unity. So we call that as the unity loop gain frequency represented using omega u. What about the phase? What is the value? <laughs> Minus 90 throughout. Okay, so what is the phase margin? So that will be equal to 180 plus ankle of L of J omega U. So this is equal to 180 minus 90. This gives you plus 90. So what comments can you make about the stability of the system? 
this is a stable system. So this looks like unconditionally stable, right? I can choose any value of ICP, KDLC, and the system is still stable, right? So there is something that you have to remember here. We have done some approximations into getting into this model, right? We have ignored the sampling behavior and assumed that the system is, we are looking at the average behavior of the system. And this is valid when <laughs> our omega ref is much, much larger than omega u. So provided this is satisfied, then our system is unconditionally stable. So in general, when we design for DLS, we make sure that our omega ref is at least greater than omega u. Oh, yeah, omega ref by 10 is greater than omega u. Okay. So when you design a DLL and you choose ICP, KDL, C, et cetera, you have to make sure that this criteria is met. Okay, now let's calculate omega u. Can you tell me what is the value? Two pi c. So this is the frequency where L of j omega becomes equal to one, right? So now what would be omega u? ICP KDL by 2 pi C. So this will be equal to ICP KDL by 2 pi C. Okay. Omega ref? Omega ref should be, uh, so the time constant with which the DLL is responding that has to be much, much larger than PRF. Is, is this clear? Okay. So omega u is given by ICP KDL by 2 pi c. That means now I can simply represent my L of s as omega u by s. Is this okay? Now let's look at our closed loop transfer function. So can you do the calculation and tell me what the closed loop transfer function is? So I need the value of phi out of s divided by phi ref of s. So let me quickly derive this. So phi ref of s minus phi out of s into omega u by s plus phi ref of s equal to phi out of s. So I can take phi ref of s to the other side. So this will be equal to minus of phi ref of s minus phi out of s, right? Now this equality will make sense only if phi ref of s is equal to phi out of s. So that means our transfer function is equal to unity, right? So what we are expecting to see is something like this. For all values of omega, if I plot this transfer function, I should see the same value one, okay? Now let's see if this makes sense or not. So we are going to analyze this for small values of omega, let's say our omega is much, much smaller than omega u, then what happens in the system? OK, 
Okay, so our phi, phi ref of t is varying very slowly, right? And then our phi out of t will be able to track phi ref of uh, t because this gate, this path has a very large gain. Okay, so any phi error here will be reduced to zero because this path has a large gain. Therefore, phi out of f will be same as phi ref of. F. Okay, so our L of j omega is very high. Therefore, phi out of phi out will be equal to phi ref. Okay, what happens when my omega is much much larger than omega u? Now this path has zero gain, right? Because this path has zero gain, nothing is getting injected here. Therefore, any phase variation appearing here will directly appear here. You have to remember, this is a delay chain. Anything that is happening at the input is going to appear at the output. The question is now whether that change is happening after exactly T ref or after some other delay. And we have removed that delay from here because this is much, much smaller than the settling time constant of the DLL, right? So in practice, if you consider the effect of the delay here, that the VCDL has a finite delay, you'll see that there is a peaking on this line. But in general, this is an all-pass transfer function. Anything you do at the input of the delay line will appear at the output, okay? So the result you have got is correct. Now we can actually analyze this in time domain with a little detail. So let me just complete this. So this is low and therefore phi out is still equal to phi ref. So let's take a reference of T and I'm assuming that steady state is reached. Okay. So I'm assuming that the steady state has been reached. So the edges are aligned perfectly. Now let's say I there is a slow variation in the phase, which means that this phase has uh, decreased slightly. That means the uh, edge has delayed slightly. So we expect to see similar delays in all these edges because the variation is happening very slowly, right? So now corresponding to this edge, now this edge has to appear at the output as it is, right? So this appears at the output, on top of it, the VCDL might introduce an additional delay. Now that depends on what, the v what our PFD is detecting at the input. So PFD is going to detect this delay. Corresponding to this, is this edge going to get delayed or advanced? It has to get delayed, right? PFD is simply going to the whole loop. Is sim the loop has control only over out of T. So it can either delay it or advance, advance it. It has now recognized that the ref of T has been delayed a little. So correspondingly, it will try to delay the out signal also. So initially, this is going to get delayed slightly more than required, right? Now, in the next phase, we again measure with respect to the reference edge. So you have some delta one. Now this output is going to be so this edge has appeared as it is, plus it has recognized some delta one, correct? Now, corresponding to this, is the out edge going to get delayed or advanced? Advanced, right? So this is going to advance a little. So this way, if the fluctuation is happening very slowly, it will eventually be able to track the change. Is this clear? Now, let me consider the opposite case where there is a high frequency fluctuation in ref of T space. So let's say initially it gets delayed, then it gets advanced then it gets delayed, et cetera. 
let's say this delay was equal to delta one. This advancement is delta two, delta three, etc. So if I assume that they were perfectly aligned in the beginning, we are going to measure this delta one, right? And corresponding to this, the loop is going to try to delay the next edge of the out, okay? So now, because this edge is delayed, it is already going to appear with a delay of delta one. On top of this, VCDL delay has also been increased. So it is going to appear here, slightly. The delays that the VCDL is going to in, uh, introduce will be very small. So it's going to appear here. Is, is this clear? So it will be delta one plus some value. Let me call this as plus delta one. Okay, now this time when you are measuring the phase error, this is the whole phase error that it is going to measure. It's much larger. Now, correspondingly, for the next edge, we will have to advance the out. That means the VCDL delay has to be reduced. On top of that, the advanced edge is going to appear at the output, right? So the edge is going to appear at the output in an advanced fashion. And on top of that, the VCDL has adjusted the delay like this. So you are again going to measure a large jitter. So this way, the total delay of the VCDL is going to fluctuate around TREF, right? And if you notice, this fluctuation is more than the fluctuation at the input because the edge is already delayed. On top of that, the VCDL is trying to correct for it, but the fluctuations are happening so fast, the VCDL keeps correcting in the opposite direction in every cycle, right? So this is why in practice, you would see a jitter peaking. Now, if you want to model this jitter peaking, this peaking in the transfer function also properly, then we have to do this in Z domain using Z transforms, or we have to introduce this E power minus ST ref and also account for the sampling nature of the DLL in the model. So that gets cumbersome and often we do not get enough circuit intuitions to work with. So what we generally do is we make sure that omega ref is much, much larger than omega u. And then we design it with the understanding that you can expect some peaking around, uh, this will be roughly around omega ref by two. Okay. Now, if this peaking is a concern to you, then it can be modeled in Z domain and you can exactly calculate the value of the peaking. So in the next class, we'll also look at the Z domain modeling of the DL. Okay. But is this closed loop transfer function behavior intuitively clear? This peak can be so now this is a sampled system, right? So you cannot have a peaking at a higher frequency because the system is sampled at omega ref. So even if you had a uh, you had noise in the system, which was a much much higher multiple of omega ref, you would still see its effect at the opposite edges. You would see the effect only at these edges. Now, if the effect happens to be in the same direction. Then you would, huh, yeah, I guess you can say the peaking would be periodic, right? So you would see the effect at, uh, if, even if you have a very high frequency, let's say this was omega ref, this was at omega ref by two, here you would see the peaking because the opposite edges have, uh, are moving in the, alternate edges are moving in the opposite direction, right? Now, it, really doesn't make sense to look at higher frequencies because S domain model is not valid. So you usually, uh, if you want to look at higher frequencies, it sort of doesn't make sense because the system is sampled at omega. Mm -hmm. So the S domain model that we have done, that assumes a continuous time behavior, right? But if I simply look at the 
waveforms involved, you'll see that the waveforms are actually step waveforms. And then we are approximating it like this. Now, the system, it's not just about the uh, LPTV nature, right? This waveforms are also not continuous. They are discrete in nature in some sense. So I think it's a combination of both. The S domain model itself doesn't become valid uh, if you are looking at phase uh, information at very high frequency. This is now a sample system. So a lot of information will get aliased back into the uh, baseband frequencies to look at. Uh, so when we do it in Z domain model, I think a lot of these would get clearer. Okay, so next let's look at how the power supply sensitivity of the circuit is. Now, what do we mean by power supply sensitivity? Let's say I have an inverter. Now we are of course interested in the phase accumulated or phase that has decreased when our signal passes through an inverter, right? Now we to always imagine our VDD to be a very stable supply like this, but instead you will see that there are fluctuation around the supply. Now because of this, our VSG of this PMOS is going to vary, which means the current available for charging the capacitor is going to vary. Therefore our delay is going to vary. So in effect, you can think of that the supply is injecting some phase noise, some small signal phase, which is basically a noise into our model, right? Now we have to incorporate this within our delay lock loop. And it turns out the most sensitive circuit within a delay lock loop to the power supply is our VCDL. So the VCDL tends to get maximum sensitivity to the power supply. That's a general, general case that we see, okay? So now we have to model the following. If there is a variation in VDD, how does that appear in our VCDL phase, okay? So we generally model this in terms of the small signal gain. That is, we would bias our VCDL at proper supply voltage, see what the expected delay is. And then we would vary the VDD slightly. So we do a delta VDD, and then we will see what is the delta change in the phase, okay? And then we can calculate the gain of the system, KVDD as do phi VCDL divided by do VDD. So you can basically plot the delay of the VCDL for a few points around the nominal VDD, and then calculate the slope of that to get this KVDD. Once you do that, this can now easily be incorporated into the DLL as the following. So there is a small signal uh, variation in the VDD. This sees a gain stage KVDD and you have an output phase phi VCD. Okay, now where do I incorporate this in my DLL small signal model? Where should I add this? Here. So I'll simply add it to this point, right? Yeah. This is okay. So now can you tell me what is the gain from VDD to phi out of S? Please calculate the gain and do the body plots. So what is the first step? What happens to phi ref of S? So there are now two independent sources to the system. 
this is a linear system and we are interested in calculating the effect of VDD of S to phi out of S. So superposition is valid. We de-energize this to zero. Okay. So now this is VDD of S into K VDD plus minus phi out of S into omega U by S is equal to phi out of S. So VDD of S into KVDD equal to phi out of S to 1 plus omega U by S. Therefore, phi out of S by VDD of S is KVDD by 1 plus omega U by S. So let me make it into the standard form. So I'll multiply both the numerator and the denominator with S by omega U. So this is KVDD into S by omega U divided by 1 plus S by omega U. So we have a zero. What is the position of the zero? Zero at origin and pole at <coughs> pole at minus omega. U. So this is an LHP pole. <coughs> so if I'm looking at phi out by VDD, is this a high pass or a low pass transfer function? We will see that this is a high pass transfer function. And what is the steady state value? When the omega is much, much larger than omega u, what do you get? K -vary. Okay. So now let's see if this makes sense intuitively. When the phase when the variation in VDD is very small, the variation in the phase getting injected here is also very small, right? Which means now we are going to see a phi error of S, which is varying slowly. So our loop will have very large gain and it will try to inject the equal and opposite uh, phase here, such that the error seen here is zero. So for small variations in VDD, we will not see anything at phi out of s. Right? Now, if the variation in VDD is at very high frequency, if it's fluctuating very, very quickly, then we will see a phi error of s, but that is fluctuating very quickly. Therefore, the loop gain is now very small. It is zero. Therefore, even though there is a phi error of s at this point, we are not able to inject anything to this node. Right? Therefore, whatever variation is happening at VDD will appear at the output directly. Therefore, we have the gain as VDD into KVDD at very high frequency. And hence, we have a high pass transfer function. Okay. So, can you tell me what is the bandwidth of this transfer function? So, I'm looking at the 3 dB bandwidth. So, I have to equate, take the magnitude at J omega and equate this to 1 by root 2. What do I get? Sorry, not 1 by root 2. It should be KVDD by root 2. Final value. Omega U. This is a first order system. So this is same as Omega U. <laughs> okay. Now let's calculate the transfer function from PFD to the output.
So I'm going to be injecting some noise here. This is to model the noise introduced by the PFD. And why would PFD inject any noise? Sorry. Jitter is, uh, so jitter is basically what we'll convert to uh, phase information at a later stage. But why would PFD have a jitter in the first place? If input is having, then it is fire up of S which has a jitter, right? Yeah. So PFD is also finally made of transistor. Transistors will have thermal noise, clicker noise, all kinds of random noises, right? Which means in the presence of this noise, you will see that the edges tend to shift. Okay. Now this causes jitter, which in phase domain we will represent as a uh, five PFD. So this is one cause. The other cause could be maybe the supply voltage of the PFD is also varying. And because of that, the PFD outputs will also have a jitter, right? So I have been talking about, I have given you a brief introduction of what jitter is when we discussed uh, D flip-flop based uh, PD. Now jitter is some represented in time domain. The corresponding information in phase domain is what we call as phase noise. This is a very simplistic understanding. It's slightly more involved than that. But I've been building up enough suspense to jitter and phase noise so that finally when we cover, all of you will be excited to learn about it. Okay, so we'll cover these topics in detail after mid -term. So right now, all that you have to understand is there is some small signal noise in phase domain that is getting injected at PFT. Okay. So now can you calculate the transfer function from phi PFD to phi out of S? One by? That's not right. Okay, so again, as before, the first step is to de energize phi rough of S. And then let's calculate. So this is phi PFD minus phi out of S into omega U by S equal to phi out of S. Therefore, phi PFD into omega u by s will be equal to phi out into one plus omega u by s. So phi out of s by phi PFD of s is equal to omega u by s by one plus omega u by s. Now I make it into the standard form by multiplying with s by omega u. So this gives us the following expression. So this has a pole edge. What is the pole position? Minus omega u. So LHP pole, this is a stable system. Is this a high pass or a low pass transfer function? It's a low pass transfer function. So if I plot phi out by phi PFT, I would see something like this. This is at omega u. Okay. Now, does this make sense? If I inject a noise here, why should that see a low pass transfer function to the output? Feel free to discuss and then let me know. This is equal to omega u. Okay. Now, what comments can you make about the bandwidth of the DLL? Does it make sense to define a bandwidth for the DLL? Uh, this is an all pass transfer function, but still a bandwidth is defined. So this is also called as the tracking bandwidth of the DLL. And this is defined as omega u. 
Okay, so if you talk about bandwidth of a DLL, this is usually the tracking bandwidth and that is just this omega u. Because all pass transfer function happens from phi ref to phi out because of the feed forward, right? Because it's simply a delay line. Now for all the other transfer functions, it will have a bandwidth of uh, omega u. Therefore, overall we say the tracking bandwidth of the delay lock loop is omega u. Now the term tracking bandwidth comes because it also relates to the settling time of the DLL, right? So if I'm looking at the settling time constant, a quick way to see this is to think of a first order system. Now let's say I had a first order system with a transfer function A0 by one plus S tau. Now, if I give a step input, that is u of t in Laplace domain, this is one by s, what is the output I would get? Yes, so you would get a naught into one minus e power minus t by tau, right? Where this tau is the settling time of the circuit now. So similarly, our expression now has one plus s by omega u in the denominator, right? Therefore, can you compare and tell me what is the settling time of the DLL? This is simply one by omega u. So the settling time constant of the DLL is omega u, which we call as its tracking bandwidth. So we have covered uh, most of the analysis related to uh, different transfer functions of the delay lock loop. Now, one thing to keep in mind is this phi ref of s, phi pfd, phi out of s, all these are small signal phase variations, which is usually phase noise, the noise in the system, right? So now let me give you a small task. We have seen, we have started the discussion of this delay lock loop because we wanted to implement a flash TDC, right? Now we have seen this delay lock loop completely. Can you implement a flash TDC now using this uh, delay lock loop? So you can think about this, I'll end the recording here.